So now we're going to switch a little bit and we'll go into and move into uh, kind of what the U.S. beef numbers look like. Uh, one of the things that we talk about oftentimes and you'll hear in market reports and other things is the, the U.S. beef cow inventory. Uh, and if we, as we discussed, the cow is a mature beef animal that is in production, so she's producing offspring. Uh, and what that, that, that animal is that's producing offspring, we know that that's going to be an indication. Those numbers will be an indication of what the future production will be. So if she has a calf today and she's in production and she gives birth to a calf today, we know that about 17 to 20 months from now that that animal will go into beef. And so we're looking at uh, the, the future, future production potential of that. And so oftentimes when we're looking at our numbers, whenever we see a spike in uh, prices related to maybe decrease in numbers, there's always a lag time or usually a lag time for the numbers to catch up and then prices to come down. And so oftentimes we talked about a cattle cycle and we'll get into that. But if you look at the U.S. beef inventory, uh, the U.S. beef cow inventory peaked in uh, the uh, early 1970s and then, uh, and then it began to uh, drop off uh, and we got into some of our lower numbers uh, here in, in recent years and, and actually 2012, 2013 some of our numbers were the lowest. If we look at uh, U.S. beef cattle inventory and beef production uh, one of the things that's interesting is that, that our cattle inventory is, is uh, diminished over time and we've got less cattle, but our beef production has, has maintained and actually increased some. And so the total cattle inventory is the smallest since 1952. However, our beef production is 2.6 times larger uh, than then. And so that's the amazing thing is we're, we're be able to produce more beef with less animals at the end of the day trying to reduce the, uh, the carbon footprint that we do have. And so this particular slide uh, discusses the USB production per cow and you can see back as we go into 1950 the uh, pounds or carcass weight we were looking at just a little over 200 pounds uh, into as we move into uh, 2015 and today uh, we're looking at uh, a carcass weight well over uh, 700 pounds on the average per cow and so we've changed and we've increased our production considerably over time again we've done some things differently we're, we're producing more beef per animal so with that we've increased our our harvest weights which subsequently will increase our carcass weights in those cattle to produce bigger calves that go in to make bigger, uh, bigger animals to be harvested, we probably also increased our cow size as well, and we definitely have done that in relation to the 1950s. And so since we've increased our cow size, we probably can run less cows on our, on our, our, our pastures as well. So there is some give and take there, but ultimately at the end of the day, we were able to increase the efficiency by producing more beef with less animals. If you look at some recent numbers there, if we look at cold carcass weights uh, in the United States and, and where we've averaged and looking at 2014 and 15, as we go from the 80s to now, we've seen an increase from about 635 pounds all the way up to nearly an 800 pound uh, carcass weight on average uh, today. And so you could see we've seen a really big jump uh, and actually in the latter part of 2015, we saw about uh, over just a couple of month period, we saw an increase in about 37 pounds because we did see a lot of cattle being held and trying to hold them for the market and it, it changed some dynamics of our beef industry there. So we're seeing a lot of bigger cattle. If we look at the average beef production and how it's broke out among the classes of cattle that contribute to the overall beef supply, of course the fed beef portion of it, so the cattle that are coming out of the feed yards is about 70% of our beef production. Uh, the next portion would be the uh, fed dairy side, so those animals that, that are not turned back around, the females that go in, don't go into milk production or the, the, the bull mates to those females, uh, those are ended up being fed and so that's about 14% of it. The next portion it would be the beef cow. Uh, and so those market cows or the cull cows and bulls that are no longer fertile and no longer productive on the ranch, so about 8% of our beef comes from them. Uh, about 
6% uh, comes from the dairy side, those animals that are no longer in milk production. Uh, they're turned into beef. And then finally, the smallest portion, about 2% of our beef comes from bulls. And so bulls that are no longer fertile are no longer able to uh, breed cows uh, in the commercial operation. We turn those into beef product as well. So that gives you an idea of kind of where it breaks out. Uh, but about 70% of our beef patronage is going to come from the feed yards. And so uh, this particular slide just talks a little bit about uh, beef production over time and when we see some of the highest beef production. And then also as it relates to a five-year average compared to this year. Uh, and you could see earlier in, in uh, 2015, we had a, a much lower beef production there. Uh, this really talks about uh, and gives you an example of kind of the cattle cycle. And so as we, we look at when we expect to see expansions in the beef cow herd is whenever we see those lower numbers of cattle producing less tonnage of beef, which increases our prices. So we begin to signal and tell people as long as production conditions are okay, we're going to increase our cow numbers so we start retaining females. And so as you can see, a couple of different expansions there as we saw an expansion in the early 90s. Uh, began to take place. Some of our larger numbers were in uh, 2000. We saw a decrease in those numbers uh, because of decreased prices, but also some drought conditions that happened. And then we also saw a really dramatic decrease from 2010 all the way, and we got into uh, 2013, and some of that was because of the drought. But then also we began to see an expansion which took cattle replacement females out of the meat market and uh, put them into production. So we saw, so we began to see that and we're seeing that expansion today as we're looking at going into 2016 coming up now. And you can see on this particular slide as we've seen uh, the current expansion as we move in from 2011, we saw some of the lowest numbers of cattle which signaled high prices which told producers it's time to go ahead and start keeping replacement females because the weather began to cooperate. And so we've seen a an increase in the number of replacement females that will eventually increase our total cow numbers there. Again, this slide begins to show some prediction of what we're looking at in beef cow inventory as we go from the lowest levels in beef cows would have been 2013 and we began to see that expansion and what some of the predicted expansion is going to be over time. With that, as we see more cow numbers, we would expect our total beef supply per capita to increase as well. And this particular slide talks about some of the, the increases <coughs> and what's proposed or expected to be in red over the next couple of years. With that, as we see increases in supply of product, we would expect to also see uh, more product out there. If we don't increase our demand concurrently, we will see some prices begin to decrease and, and we will expect to see some softening of prices. In the, <clears throat> in the latter part of 2015, again, we talked about uh, a really tremendous decrease in prices because we had a glut of beef uh, on the market at that time. And so again, as we talk about that, those just gives you some idea of some numbers and, and, and the beef numbers historically here in the United States. <clears throat>